Good morning, everybody. I think we'll make a start if that's okay. Um, it's 11.06. I'm sure we've got some more people joining us midway through. I'll just spend a few moments talking to you about introductions and the purpose of today's event, etc. And then we'll get cracking straight away. So again, welcome. My name is Tevik Solomon. Everybody knows me as Tev, uh, and I'm the Social Enterprise Development Manager here at Forward. Uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague and our host for today, uh, Stephen Anderson. Stephen, please do give us a wave. Hi, everyone. Steve, working under the Forward Enterprise Fund, uh, and as I said, he'll be helping me with the. Um, oops, I'm muted. Am I muted? We can hear you, Tev. Fantastic. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, Stephen is the enterprise coach uh, for the trust and he has uh, most of the dealings with uh, most of our clients who we take on board who um, are would-be entrepreneurs. Uh, I'd like to briefly introduce the panel to you all. So we've got Benji Trent, who is an associate director of Delights. Benji, please do give us a wave and say hello. Hi, everyone. Real, real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, we've got David Barker, a serial internet and social entrepreneur. David, please do give us a wave and say hello. Hi, Forward to chatting with you today. Uh, we have Michael, whose surname I'm not about to pronounce, but who is, Michael is the founder of uh, the Pink Umbrella Studios. Michael, similarly give us a wave, please. Hi, everyone. And last but not least, we have uh, LJ Flanders, who um, is the founder of The Cell Workout. So LJ, please do give us a wave too. Hello everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, thank you guys. So I'll just explain a bit about the purpose of the event. Uh, and essentially it's been organized as part of the Forward Enterprise Fund, a project administered by the Forward Trust in partnership with Social Investment Business. Uh, today we hope to provide some useful information around setting up as an entrepreneur, in addition to some motivation and inspiration to show that anything is possible, even after having served a custodial sentence. The Forward Enterprise Fund is a blend of unsecured finance and grants to organisations which are based in England and which, which are either ex-offender or those in recovery led or creating employment opportunities for those within these cohorts. The support includes crowdfunder match funding up to £5,000 for suitable projects, formal business support through our list of approved business support providers and for those who are at the early stage of setting up their enterprise, free enterprise support and, support and coaching by our enterprise coach Stephen. Uh, for those who have attended, please feel free to contact myself or Stephen for any further information around this or visit our website, which should appear very shortly in the chat function. I'd also like to have a cheeky plug of uh, some really exciting work that we've got going on with Deloitte at the moment. We're in the process of planning a series of masterclasses uh, with various esteemed colleagues at Deloitte, uh, mainly around uh, setting up in different business entities, tax VAT and marketing so please do keep an eye out for any promotional material around this sometime in August. Uh, you will all have seen that I've attached the a fact sheet uh, as part of the joining in details um, yesterday. Uh, please do uh, take a look at that at some point if you really haven't done so and in particular I'd like to draw your special attention to a YouTube link uh, which appears on that document uh, which is uh, basically a really useful um, video published by David Barker um, set uh, around setting up in um, uh, self-employment during a crisis. Just speak a little bit about the running order. So we will kick off the event shortly by identifying eight stages of which a, sexual, a successful entrepreneur should consider when setting up their business. And I will be asking David and Benji to provide some of their own insights into these uh, in, in, during the first part of the event. We will then hear from Michael and LJ about their experiences and journeys of becoming entrepreneurs after having served a prison sentence. And of course, time permitting, we will have some opportunity for some questions and answers uh, from the audience at the end. Just a very, very brief reminder about some Zoom and event etiquette. Please uh, arrange for uh, your, mic, your, your mics to be muted, uh, obviously, if you're not speaking, in order to uh, avoid any interruptions and background noise. Um, please be aware that the event is recorded, so please ensure that your video option is off if you would not like to appear. Uh, we will be planning to uh, upload the video to our YouTube site in due course. For those who are not experienced users of the Zoom platform, you can alter the view options of your screen by clicking the speaker view 
icon in the top right of your screen during the event. And last but not least, as I've mentioned before, uh, we will be taking questions via the chat option on Zoom. These will be monitored closely, so do please raise any questions through the function and uh, we will be arranging for each question um, to be raised by the uh, relevant person raising the question by arranging them to come off mute to ask the question themselves. Anyway, that's enough from me. Uh, I hope that everybody enjoys the event. Uh, we've all been really looking forward to it, so um, I suppose we'll be a bit of crack on. So, I mentioned that there were eight stages of which we feel uh, a successful entrepreneur will go through uh, during their, their journey. And the first stage that we have identified is the requirement to develop the right mindset to set up your business. Uh, so, David and Benji, who would like to tackle that question? Thanks, Kev. I think I will. Uh, I will kick off with that. Are we going to be sharing the the points on the screen, or you just no? You it's just, just a, a, a freestyle on your part, there, David. Cool. That sounds good. Okay. Start. Thanks. So, so as Kev was saying, that you know, I think that there's a lot said about becoming a successful entrepreneur, and it's all about having an amazing idea or having an amazing product. But actually, I think the starting point to that is having the right entrepreneurial mindset. It's being in the right state of mind to be able to actually start a business and then to become successful. On delivering creating a you know a viable business and a sort of successful successful one now there's loads that you can say about this but on the in this sort of uh, the primary reasons i'm going to limit myself to three main parts of having this entrepreneurial mindset so to start with number one you have to believe in yourself running your own business is, is not easy it can actually be really hard it's not always clear it's not always clear what you should do next whether you're making the right decisions the chances are that as you go through that journey you're going to experience some challenges and you're going to experience failure. So it's absolutely crucial that right from the beginning that you have that safe self-belief in yourself to make sure that when you experience those challenges, you can get through them and you can create a success. In addition to that, actually often requires a really huge leap of faith. So if you don't have that leap of faith, you're never going to be able to get started. Ultimately, if you don't believe in yourself, no one else is going to. The second part of having this mindset is that I think you have to be really passionate about the business that you're trying to build. As we're going to hear about a bit later, there's lots of people that you have to take on that journey when you're setting up your own business. And you're only going to be able to do that and engage all of those people if you're passionate and really care about the thing that you're trying to create. This is actually something that I see the whole time in my kickboxing dojo. I look at my head sensei, who's a former world and European champion, and I can just see how much she cares about the martial art and how much she cares about her students. And it's because of this passion that she's created a really interesting business for herself. And she has lots of really, really loyal customers. I should point out, though, that I don't feel quite so loyal when she's screaming at me to sort of kick higher and to do faster burpees. My loyalty tends to sort of slip when it comes to that. And then the final point about this entrepreneurial mindset is that I think you have to allow yourself to dream big and to be ambitious in your plans. I'm not suggesting that right from the beginning you go out there and commit to building some huge business and risk all your money to try to do that. But what I am saying is that you need to allow yourself to dream big and think about what that brilliant business and that brilliant success could look like. Now, you're probably sitting there thinking, well, that really depends. And that's true. It is definitely a matter of perspective. Big success might be hiring one extra person or big success might be opening up locations in lots of different countries. It really does depend. My best mate actually has recently set up a business selling on Amazon and he's got these big dreams about how he wants to sell lots of different products and sell all across Europe. But the place that he's starting in, he's starting with one product and he's trying to make that a success first in Europe. So, sorry, a success first in the UK. But the crucial thing is that because he's dreaming about it, he's not limiting himself right from the beginning. So just to summarize very quickly, so I think it sets a very important context for the whole of our conversation today. To have this entrepreneurial mindset, you have to believe in yourself you have to be passionate about what you're trying to build and you have to allow yourself and give yourself a luxury to dream big and think about what success can look like so i think you're on mute, you're on mute. Okay. thank you very much benji that was a very comprehensive and and well thought answer uh, we'll move on to the next uh, stage that we have identified and that's all about picking the right business idea. Uh, who'd like to tackle that one, guys? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that one, Tev. Um, yeah, I think building on what Bendy's just said, actually. So my, my first business, um, I set it when I was 23 years old. 
um, and it went on to become one of the UK's leading digital marketing agencies. We were doing websites, advertising campaigns, email, social media for big brands like Intel, Microsoft, Cisco, Unilever, big automotive companies. Um, but that's where it get, gets to. It's too easy to look at the success of companies, but really what you need to look at is how did it start? And it started with just four 23-year-olds working for another company as employees who just saw the internet and thought, this is exciting. I feel like Benji said, you've got to be excited about creating that business. So we saw the internet, we learned about it. We, had, we didn't have any money, we just left our jobs, had no income. We got five grand from the Prince's Trust and that, that got us going. Um, and then, yeah, but we, we didn't dream big. We didn't dream about taking over the world. We just wanted to get into this exciting industry. Um, but we didn't start with all those services. We just started with one, like Benji said. It's, we couldn't do all that, but what we could do was websites. So we just became very good at designing and building websites. We launched with that. Um, you may have heard the phrase, the minimum viable product. Well, that also applies to services that you might deliver as a business. What's your minimum viable service you can deliver to start making money? start making money get very good at that um and then as that money came in well you know what now we can start doing online advertising campaigns we hired staff that had that skill set we started to deliver that and then we started to do uh, social media campaigns again we hired people to do that <clears throat> but we start with one service um and then built out from there as benji said his friend may go on to drive his products across europe but you can't start there start small start good get re referrals for good work, for good craftsmanship, you know, good craftsmanship is so important. It's the problem today and the challenge is there's so many people trying to sell probably similar services. And I think what makes you stand out is your character, your craftsmanship, that, that extra bit of work, a bit like a carpenter. You can get a shoddy carpenter who just does it and leaves, mm -hmm. but the best ones are the ones that add the extra little bit extra thing. Wow, that, that's really cool. So yeah, make sure your craftsmanship is really good, whatever you're doing, and then start to build out from there. But yeah, start with one minimum viable service or product and then scale out from there. Thanks so much, David, for that. Uh, the next stage that we've identified is testing the idea. Uh, who would like to deal with that? Yeah, I, I, can, I can probably flow on from... Um, and my first business, actually, we didn't have to test the idea. We just had to get someone to pay us some money to deliver a website. So my second business was very different. Um, at the problem of too many people being unemployed. Um, and when I met charities at events, they kept saying government kept funding training programs but they're not working, but they keep funding the same training program. So I looked at all the training programs, came up with a new idea, a new training program uh, that would develop the technical skills, the digital skills and the soft skills that we need today in the modern economy. Um, but then I needed to test that idea. But the key was the charities that were complaining about bad training from government were the ones that then let me test the idea with them. So I always say, if you're gonna research the market to understand what you wanna create as a business, the theory is those first people you, you find that are complaining about the current market become your test bed for your idea. So they are a brilliant test your program on our young people that are unemployed. We ran the test program. All those young people got into work through that program. Um, and then from there, I was able to move forward to getting money from government and deliver that in seven cities across the UK. One woman, 19 years unemployed, is now working through that unique program. So, uh, so yeah, I, I always say, whatever your idea is, research well. The people that are complaining about the current system should be the ones that let you test on them, and then they'll be your champions helping you get funding and, and scale out from there. Um, but, yeah, that's how I've... Oh, I've always... I mean, I've now created five businesses, and they all start with the same process. It is a process that works and works very well. Thank you, David. Uh, the next uh, stage which uh, we feel needs to be discussed is all about organising your business. Um, again, guys, who'd like to um, take that one up? I think I will, uh, I, I will go for this one. Thanks, Ted. And I suppose just sort of say it's also as part of my introduction. Michael and now. I don't actually draw 
of working with lots of amazing startup founders and CEO and you know working them and learning from them and that's what I'm sort of looking to share on this panel today but when it comes to organizing to sort of organizing your business and some of the administrative sort of steps involved in sort of doing that I think the bit that's I think the thing that's really important to know is that you don't have to do it all at the beginning you don't have to jump straight away to getting an office leasing an office and you know putting lots of staff in there but that's not the thing that's important I think the bit that's really important is about taking the time to learn and research and understand some of the things that you might have to do from an administrative perspective down the line and start to be aware of them so maybe that you don't miss them out if you should have done them already but also that you're mentally prepared in due course to start the class is coming with some more detail sort of run by some of my colleagues at Deloitte but what I think I wanted to do was just sort of mention very briefly a couple of the key things to sort of think about from the outset I think the first one is to think about setting up a business bank account and not relying on your personal bank account to sort of manage your business. And the reason why this is important is because you can find that you end up wasting a lot of your time trying to track the transactions and the money going in and out between your personal stuff and also your business. So having it in a separate account allows you to keep track of that. And the reason why that's really important is that number one, it saves you time, but also is that when it comes to doing things like submitting your tax return, and make sure that you can track all of the expenses that you've got going on so that you can claim the benefit of all of those business expenses in your tax return and get the benefit of it. The other reason why this is important is that if you come to get a loan from some form of business finance option, often they will only do that if you actually have a business account available and that you can prove that you've got money going in and out of that account. The second point then on the sort of administrative side is you might want to think about setting up a limited company. And the way that you can do this is through company's house. It's very quick, it's easy to do, and actually it's all very cheap as well. And it also gives you the option to register for corporation tax at the same time. Now, the reason why it's, well, probably one of the most powerful reasons about why you might, why, why you might want to think about doing this is this concept of limited liability. If you set up a limited company and it is run out of, and you run your business from it, what that means is that the, is that the liability and the exposure that you might have to debt sits within the company rather than with yourself. The reality is that being an entrepreneur is risky. Running your own business is risky. And so what that means is that if in the worst happens and your business goes bust, the liability sits with the company and doesn't sit on you from a personal perspective. The final point I just wanted to mention really quickly is that you might also want to think about buying a website URL. And what this means is that you're able to then in due course set up a website under that name, but also have an email address that is actually linked to your company. So in my case, rather than having Benji, at googlemail.com, instead it could be benji at benjilimited.com. And because so much of communication takes place over email, it gives you the chance to be more professional and sort of be consistent on your like online So I suppose just to reiterate, there's loads of things you could do. You could register for VAT, you could set up PAYE so you can tax and pay employees, you could hire office space. The really crucial thing is, is that you do your research, you understand what some of these things are in advance, and if you don't understand what's involved, reach out for advice, look online, or indeed go to people like the Forward Trust who have the resources and guidance to be able to support you understanding the steps that are required. Great stuff, Benji. Thank you so much for that. Um, moving on to stage five, it's all about building your network, the need to make connections with potential customers. Who'd like to take that one? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll jump in on that. So, um, I, I mean, in every talk or every session I give, I always say that for me, the, the critical point of success is networking. You can't underestimate it. And, and in fact, I'm sure all the business development opportunity, all the new opportunities I ever got came from networking. Um, so there's two ways to do that. One is obviously physical events. Um, and the good news about going to physical events is you'll learn something from the speakers so always go there where that can learn from the speakers that's your first point of a networking contact whoever the speaker is listen to them engage with them after the event but then connect with them on LinkedIn and then very the problem is if you then just add them to your network they probably will decline or ignore it but if you add a note saying hey I saw you speak at that event I love what you said about and give them, give them some comment and compliment them on something they said that resonated could I connect with you um, and be part of our network. And you'll be surprised, that's how they then connect. So that's how you do it from a physical event. But then it's about the people you meet at the event. So maximize those coffee moments. 
the, the random meeting with somebody. Um, and it can be quite daunting to go to a group of people who are already conversing. But I always say, just see someone, just go over and say hello. Never start about yourself. Always start about them. Just listen to what they're saying. And then, then they'll give you a chance to talk about yourself. So that's physical events and, and they're really important. Um, but then in the world of virtual events, you can also do the same. You'd be surprised now, so many events are online. You can listen to the speakers, but the process is the same. Follow up on LinkedIn, compliment them, connect on the network. Um, a lot of these events on virtual now also are doing virtual coffee breaks, which sounds really weird, but you just do some speed three minute um, networking and chat to people. So yeah, it is moving online, but I can't under, you can't underestimate the value of doing these events. Um, and, and that's how I've always seen success. And like I said, once you connect with them on LinkedIn, every time you post something relevant to what you're trying to do, they'll see it. And, and you'll be surprised how then those connections, because the key is networking is always about the future. And you never know what might come out of that future by just that one connection you made even a year ago. Uh, like I said, I've met so many people through that process. Um, and yeah, I can't, I can't, you can't underestimate the value of networking. Thanks so much, David. That was fantastic. Moving on swiftly. Uh, number six, all about testing, sorry, all about turning your testers into satisfied customers. And this is a discussion around obtaining reviews and testimonials uh, as a form of advertising for your business. So David Benji, who'd like to take that one? Thanks, Ted. But I, I was I was thinking about this before, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. And actually, I think there's there's two sides to this, and it's definitely an extension of what David was already talking about in terms of his experience setting up and running his own businesses. So the, the first side to this is the power of testimonials. So and positive client reviews. So it's incredibly important to use positive testimonials from previous customers as part of your marketing material. That might be on your website. That might be on your social media. It might be on a physical flyer that you distribute. It really doesn't matter. But the crucial thing is that people, people don't want to be the first ones to buy something. What they want to see is they want to see that someone else has already taken that risk, taken that leap of faith in purchasing your product. And seeing that positive testimonial makes them much more likely to purchase it for themselves. I actually saw a report once which spoke about um, sales on a site like Amazon. And they said that if you look at similar products, a product with even five reviews or a product with no reviews, that first product is like up to 300% more likely to be purchased because people can see that people have bought it in the past. On a sort of very personal level, I actually saw this myself recently. So as a result of lockdown, the people in my street set up a WhatsApp group. And at one point, uh, one of the ladies in the street posted, would anyone like her entrepreneurial young son to come and sort of wash, wash their cars for them? And so no one said anything until sort of one guy said, oh, actually, that sort of sounds quite good. And later that day, he posted to say that um, the job that the boy did was incredible and it was really, really good. Within 20 minutes, there were 10 more houses who posted on the group wanting to have their cars washed as well. So you can see the immediate power of the customer testimonial. And the other side to this and the other way of looking at it is that you don't just want to have your customers be initial testers on a one-off basis. You want repeatable customers. Now, the reason why this is so valuable is because it's incredibly time consuming from a marketing perspective and also just your time to actually attract new customers. Some people say that it can be up to 25 times more expensive to get new customers in comparison to holding on to your existing ones. So it's incredibly important that whilst you're growing your business, finding your cust new customers, you also have a plan about how you're going to hold on to your existing ones. You need to speak with them. You need to get feedback. What's going well? What's not going so well? What else can you do in order to be able to improve their customer experience? It's definitely a hard balance to manage, but repeat customers are so incredibly valuable. And once you start to get them coming back, that's when you start to generate some brand loyalty and have the opportunity to start to scale and grow your business even further. So there's sort of two sides to that. Tev, I think you're back so on mute. You. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you very much, Benji. <laughs> Still getting used to this virtual uh, event, Larky. Right. Um, <laughs> number seven on our list of eight is all about that all important uh, point of raising money. So that's uh, using families, friends, projects, etc. Who'd like to take that one, guys? Yeah, I can, I can share about that one. So, Thank uh, you, David. Yeah, uh, yeah, like I mentioned, my, my first business, we, we just left our jobs. And then actually the grant from the Prince's Trust helped. 
it was five thousand pounds and, and actually that's all we needed to kind of get that early pays the expenses gets us to those networking events and it's through the networking we met the first person i thought you know what you guys you guys sound incredible and that's where we got our first project so but the 5k grant helped to give us the freedom to do that we didn't have to pay ourselves so that's the key as well is quite often in, in the early days you, your time well it's free it's your it's your time and effort get the small grants really important see what's out there they're, they're ever changing get a few grants together can, can really make a difference um the second business um the pop-up academies that was a difficult one i couldn't i couldn't actually raise the money to get that one to market so the first thing i did was i raised what i could so i sold my house i put my house you know i basically put my own finances on the line on the belief of that one um and then but then the rest of the money i actually raised that by working back in the corporate sector for a few years so sometimes actually maybe the route to create the business you want might be working for someone else for a while to create the money to then do what you want to do so think about that as as i did my second business i didn't have enough so i actually worked for a bit to make the money i needed got that one to market and then government gave us a contract to open these pop-up academies in, in seven cities so that was a blend of my own money plus working for a bit and then the government stepped in with the scale-up funding um, and then my third one was again I, I started it myself so again I think starting up typically it's your own money uh, lend and don't forget loans so I, I've had loans from banks um, uh, to get going as well so the loans are important um, obviously that like you can repay them as well um, from, from that perspective um, and then my fourth business was I actually stopped sacrificing my own money I thought can I not do this in a new way so I launched a consultancy saying to funders why don't you contract me to innovate with you and then we'll create things together and I thought that's like no one's ever done that before so I launched this, an innovation agency which has been amazingly funded by three clients now so I got paid fifty thousand pounds to innovate a new idea and then through that we managed to raise a million so far to take that to market so I think I've cracked my own puzzle of not risking my money all the time and actually i think that's the key once you've done things a few times you become a consultant and then you can be hired to do things and help other people do it so uh, but in the in the early days a lot of the time it, it's your own money it's it, it's trying to make some money to do things but then as you get more credible there's different ways you could then generate, generate those funds but there's a myriad of ways now to tap into funds i think what the forward trust is doing you know great incubation idea model uh, again there's, there's quite a lot of incubators out there now with seed funds so it's got a lot easier today than it was a few years ago but yeah be creative about fundraising there's never just one way to do it uh, and really just come alongside people that I've, I've, I've got lots of experience in that space will help um yeah hope that's helpful thanks so much for that david so last and bottom Last but not least, we would like to uh, tackle the issue of scaling the business. So essentially this means using the capital that you've raised to scale your business to uh, uh, greater lengths. Uh, it's the final question. So Benji and David, I'll leave this for you to decide who wants to take the next, this one. Thanks, Tev. I think I will uh, go for this one. And don't worry, everyone, I'll keep it brief. I know that you want to hear from Michael and LJ and about, about, about their journeys. Um, so I think that this idea of scaling and growing your business further um there, there's no hard and fast rule you know there's no sort of like set formula about how you do it how you go about managing that scaling process it depends enormously on your personal objectives it depends where the money is coming from to grow your business how big your business is already and frankly the industry and circumstances in which you operate you might want to choose to spend money on hiring more people you might want to um, invest in developing your product further. You might look to buy more stock in anticipation of bigger orders coming in. Or actually, you might want to open up a new location for your business. You can scale in so many different ways. I think the message, though, that I wanted to share about this point is that, let, let's be honest, the opportunity to scale your business is incredibly exciting. Like, like, how amazing must it be to be in that position? It means you've had some success already, and now you have the chance to make your business even bigger and to get even more customers. Any downside to this, and in, in my professional life, I spend a lot of time talking to risk and harassing the lawyers at Deloitte because of the things I want to try to do with different companies. But the only downside and the risk to this 
is that similarly to sort of my comments about balancing new and existing customers before, you have to be really careful that when you're trying to grow your business further, you don't neglect your core business and effectively, you know, end up failing what you've already sort of created. So I think that the crucial point is, is that when you come to, when you come to scale, it's what we heard from David before, I think that becomes even more important to start to rely on your network and to reach out for guidance, either from experienced entrepreneurs, from people who have done it themselves, or indeed from organizations like the Forward Trust, who can help give you the guidance to sort of, to grow, and crucially, to make sure that you don't fall into that trap of growing too quickly. So I work right now with this really amazing technology startup, which is based in Ireland, and they recently had the opportunity to open their second office in a different country. And so they, they chose to grow, to grow and to move to the United States because that's where a big part of their market is emerging. Now the CEO actually chose to move his entire family over there so that he could manage all of that growth process himself because he was so concerned about the impact it could have. But whilst he tried to grow further, it made things sort of go, you know, go wrong initially. So I suppose that you know the key message is scaling is so so exciting and it'd be amazing to be in that position and for all of us to be in that position. It just needs to be sort of very very carefully managed. I suppose the last sort of final point, Ted, if you sort of bear with me, the last final point I just wanted to share is this idea of the entrepreneurial journey. So I'm in the process of looking to invest in a company right now, sort of through Deloitte. And if I think about why we're trying to do it, this company has an amazing product and has an amazing platform. But actually the reason why we're trying to invest in that company is because of the people. Because we really believe in those people. We want to invest in them. We want to partner with them to you know, help them on their journey to create a business. And we see an amazing opportunity to work with these people on an ongoing basis. So I suppose that when it comes to this entrepreneurial journey and going through the different stages, it is all about you and what you bring to the table and the people you can bring on that journey. And that is the most sort of most important thing at the end of the day. Great stuff. Thank you, David. Thank you, Benji, for your um, professional and expertise uh, information. I, I advice. Can I, can I jump in? Uh, Sorry, so David. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry, Stephen. Yeah, just a, just a quick one. Um, first of all, thanks, David and Benji, for that. Uh, just to let people know that we do have the chat function if you want to post questions. Uh, just a quick one. As he's posted a question here, at what point did the entrepreneurs feel it was time for an exit? And how did they do it? Noted that as many as ready for an exit. So when the entrepreneurs feel is the right time for an exit, I'm not sure if we can answer that now or if we want to answer it at the end. What do you think, Ted? Well, the question has been asked, so let's go with it for now and then we'll leave okay. the rest of questions to the end. Either Benji or David? Yeah, maybe, maybe exit a bit time of, for an entrepreneur. Yeah, maybe a bit of both. I I think, um, I think so often business can be seen as very ruthless. You know, you set up a business, it's all about making money. I'm going to exit in five years and, and, and make millions like Del Boy out of Only Fools and Horses. You know what I mean? It's just, for me, it's actually, it's not about the money. And I think that's the trap. I think most entrepreneurs just care about doing something, want to do it well, make some money, grow it. I don't think they're driven about exit. So when I've actually exited a business, it's mainly been because it just makes sense. So my first um, start up at the moment, we're looking at the next, the third round of investment. Um, and eventually you're going to get an investor saying, look, we just want to buy this. And I'll be ready to sell the shares I'll have in the business. But right now, I just want to see it scale. Um, and and, if it never, and if, even if I don't ever exit, I'll still own a piece of it and let it keep scaling. So I think, yeah, I, think, I don't think there is a formula again for exiting. It's what do you really care about? How long do you want to stay on the journey? It might be a retirement exit. It's time for me to move on. Oh, it's just the deal is so good. I mean, well, a friend of mine owned a business and he said, I'm never going to sell this until somebody sat around the table, gave him a piece of paper. So I'm not going to sell, open the piece of paper, sold. <laughs> um, but generally I'd say don't focus on the exit of the money. Just, just live your dream and, and you'll be amazed what might happen. And then exit what and, it feels like. And it's sort of, I suppose what I would add to that, another angle to that is, from the perspective of raising money, you do sometimes need to be, you need to be really careful about the investors that you start working with basically, because there's, there can be some terms and conditions that investors will require as part of the money they're putting into your company, which will give them more rights to determine when that happens. And so, you know, as we just heard from David, you know, 
building and running a business, you know, that's your baby and, and it should be up to you. So you just need to be careful again, as I was saying, to get the right advice when it comes to raising money from people to make sure that you're not giving away control of your company when actually you really don't want to and probably shouldn't be doing. Thank you, guys. Yes, thank you very much indeed. So we'll now move on to um, Michael, who we would like, who, who would like to explain a bit about his, his journey of uh, where he was and where he's at now. So Michael, the stage is yours, my friend. Please um, feel free. Okay, thank you, Chev, and uh, thanks, David and Benji. Fantastic information. Um, okay, so I'll introduce myself. My name's Michael. Uh, I'm the founder of Pink Umbrella Studios. Uh, we are a web development company based in London. Uh, I'm also an ex-prisoner. Uh, most people don't see that as uh, I've been around a bit. But anyway, so I think the best option would be to give you a quick overview and insight into where it all began for me uh, as a person. Um, I've been in business one way or another since I was a young boy, both illegal and legal. Um, my first job, like most, was a simple paper round. This didn't end well. I got in a muddle and decided to give it up. Uh, the owner of the shop, unfortunately, didn't want to pay me for the work. So uh, I went home like any young boy and told my father, you know, my ex-boss hasn't paid me. And uh, at the time, my, my father was involved in certain things and he had certain people to do certain things. Uh, if you know what I mean. So within 10 minutes, I was back in the shop with four massive fellas collecting what I was owed. Now, as you can imagine, my ex-boss, he didn't really argue to this. And this, uh, for me, at the age of 11, kind of set a way of thinking that stayed with me for a long time. So I think the first real taste of entrepreneurship for me was at the age of 13. Uh, I was approached by a friend's uncle who asked me to buy and sell mobile phones. Now this scam was known as the BT Cellnet Basher scam. I'm sure most people have heard of it. Um, it's quite a simple thing. Um, I was simply buying the phones at 50 and selling at 250 pounds. It wasn't rocket science. Uh, before long, I'd actually purchased the software myself and set up shop. And unfortunately, it also wasn't long before the police came knocking. Now. Since that day, I've been involved in many different businesses. Um, just to name a few, I've owned a bar in Spain. I've moved hashish on fast boats. I've worked as a self-employed builder. I've owned a logistic company with healthy profit margins. I've also built a car body shop from scratch. And I've even built an XC factory in the net. I simply love business. It doesn't really matter to me what product or service is. I just enjoy people and most of all, I think I enjoy the process. Um, now, obviously, David and Benji have gone over all these points extensively, but I wanted to kind of just go on to them a little bit. Um, firstly, let's talk about like my mindset. I think uh, actually I've been at a mindset of an entrepreneur since I was a child, even maybe I was born with it. I'm not too sure about the research on that, but I've always felt like I wanted to do more and, and, and do exciting things. Um, so. In fact, my mind's always actually been roughly the same in terms of entrepreneurship. Uh, the only difference now is my focus and application has evolved into what I do today. Um, you know, over the years, I've put my mind into many different endeavors. I think that created a, a, a strong foundation for business today because, um, you know, as we know, business and entrepreneurship, it, it's a tricky business uh, nowadays. It's not as easy as it used to be, I think. Um, you have to be extremely adaptable and extremely re uh, resilient. Um, yeah, on that basis, I think maybe I should talk about the process that I see business. Um, you know, I don't have long today, so I'll just try and be as concise as possible. So the process for me is fairly simple and actually fairly enjoyable. Um, the ideation stage, you know, when the idea comes along and you see a gap in the market, you, you can't beat that feeling. It's fantastic. Um, to most people, these opportunities don't come along actually very often. Uh, for me personally, I'd take this stage very slow. Um, you know, if it's a new idea, there's no need to rush. Um, many people today come up with an idea, they've not even tested it on the market and you see them run into an app development company, give all their money away and then realize actually the application is no good. Nobody, nobody cares for it. Um, so I think the, the, for me, it's just about being patient, take it slow. Uh, you know, again, test the idea. You know, this is always enjoyable, but sometimes actually it doesn't always go the way you think. So not all, guys, not all ideas are fantastic, even, even if it's not been done yet. You know, the common misconception, I think, is that if you think of something new, uh, 
it's going to be fantastic and everyone's going to love it. When in reality, that's not true. Um, so let's say you've come up with a great idea, you've, you've tested the market and everyone loves it. Uh, I think Benji said, you know, it's time to get organized. It's, it's time to set your business up. Um, this, I think, is, is a really good process uh, stage for me because you, you feel like you're building something and you feel like it's happening. You know, you're doing something different in your life. And that's because it is, you know, you really are doing something. So for me, once you've done that, it's all about getting that word out there. You know, get it out there. Build a PR and comms strategy. You know, tell the world that you exist. Uh, this stage for me, it's all about networking. I think David mentioned that. You know, if you've got the best product in the world or the service in the world, if nobody knows about it, your, your, your business is simply going to fail. That, that's fact. Now, for me, on many different businesses, um, this is kind of like before the internet was like massively important. Nowadays, it's all about building an online presence and speak to everyone you know. Uh, you know, start close to home. So I think speak to your friends, your family, all your contacts, and then you can move on to events in the area, go online, as David said, go to conferences, set up your own event, whatever it takes, really, just to get the word out there about your product or service. Now, uh, I think really that's the fun part done, actually, in terms of business process, because now you've done all that work, and now, that realistically, I think it's time to, you know, to get down and do the work. And, and to be honest, setting up any startup nowadays, it's very time consuming, it's very tiring. Uh, not to put anyone off, of course, but uh, you know, you will be doing 12, 14 hour days to get anything worth. Uh, that's fact, uh, unless you've got some extremely very nice friends who are willing to give their time. Um, but it's normally difficult. I think then it's about building trust. So, um, you know, give people some genuine feedback. A lot of companies now put a lot of stuff online that's genuine, genuine, genuinely not true. So give people some genuine feedback of your product and your service, uh, you know, a genuine online presence and a trust in the business world. It, it goes a long way and, and people are not silly. So people know, uh, I think you've picked up on it with the car washing situation. It goes a hell of a long way. Um, so now I think once the business is building traction and, and you know, at this stage, you're going to need some money. So I always try at this stage to keep the, the cost absolute to a minimal. Um, you never know what's going to happen. You know, let's look at today uh, with the situation with COVID-19. The UK has lost 20% of its GDP in, in as little as three months. So, you know, how many businesses are going under or in the process of going under as we speak? Um, you know, so just keep it to an absolute minimal. And then um, obviously we've got to look at funding or, or will your business grow organically? Uh, if so, is that fast enough for your goal or your dream? Or maybe you want to take over the business world. You know, there's certain, certainly going to need a lot of funding. Uh, what I will say to that is, um, you know, always be cautious when attempting to scale up any business. It's a very tricky part of uh, business indeed. A lot of people talk about scaling your business like it's a must. You know, I always ask the question, do you need to? Uh, what, what's the goal of the business? Where do you want to take it? You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with having a team of two if you're providing a good service, a good product and paying yourself an honest wage. You know, you don't have to be the next Google. Um, I think I've gone on enough, but what I will do, I'll leave you today with uh, three tips of my success. Uh, I think I'd like to start with contacts. Contacts for me are absolutely key. You know, keep that little black book very safe. You know, don't burn any bridges. It's not what you know, it's who you know. I know it's a, a bit of an old phrase, but it's very, very true in the business world. Um, secondly, I think would be keep learning. So it's 2020, uh, long gone are the days of leaving school at 16. And you know, that's your learning finished. You have to keep your mind fresh and sharp. It's that simple. Um, you know, I work in the development world. If I don't work for a couple of weeks on the laptop, I literally have to learn again. So you just have to keep doing that. Um, I think thirdly and lastly would be don't give up. Business is not easy. Uh, life's not easy, uh, you know, but if you keep trying, in my book, you're a winner. So that's it. Thanks for your time today. Well, very powerful and um, informative, Michael. Thanks so much for that. Really appreciate it. Um, got a nice comment from Azzy that he, he, you know, found your 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 uh, chat really honest and insightful. So many thanks for that. LJ, my man, you're up next. Hello. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for tuning in today for this uh, this webinar and. Uh, for me, the cell workout idea and the whole brand has basically been, it's nearly come up to its 10 year anniversary. And 
that's not from the day I launched the business because that was mid 2015 when I actually launched the business. But um, I say it's my anniversary because that's when I first went to prison. And for me, that's where the whole business started. Um, you know, I wasn't in the best of places before going to jail. I felt very lost, um, no focus, no structure. But from going to jail, um, was probably the kick up the backside I needed. It was, uh, it was in terms of the getting into the right mindset for the business. Um, for me, when I first went to jail, I was very depleted, very down, very unmotivated. But once I got into my fitness training, that fitness training massively helped towards a positive mindset. So just to kick your day off with a, with a bit of cardio, that's what I was trying to do to then actually get them happy hormones. And, and as well, in terms of being focused in prison, you don't have distractions. So if you're trying to create a business in the outside world, you've got your social media, your TV, your family, your, your everything, but you, your four walls, you're really made to think creatively because you've got books, you know, I chose not to put on the TV sometimes. And, and again, for, for that moment, that light bulb moment of the cell workout thing was, um, is for that, that book was born out of necessity i was a person in jail that wanted to go to the gym i couldn't go to the gym it was only twice a week so i needed something to fill that void um a brief sort of target market there's ninety thousand prison people in prison all wanting to train so i know some people get into the gym a little bit more than others so for me as a really sort of simple business plan i thought ninety thousand people a book to sort of fill that gap that was the bare bones of what i was trying to do but and then so yeah that's the business idea that's how it happened and um, but from the idea that i had in early 2012 it was three and a half years of commitment to actually write and produce a book um and again you, you can't do it all by yourself i had to ask friends family um, especially the forward, uh, sorry, the, the Prince's Trust was an amazing organisation at that point that I was you know, really, I was 21 years old and anyone under 30 looking to try and do the enterprise course, they was the first sort of charity to actually support. Um, so, so yeah, having that support there was great. And I know a few people said about taking things slowly. The three and a half years was, you know, I had to go to, I had to, go to work every day and the money I was, what, uh, money i was earning at work was going towards the funding of the book um just give you some figures the book actually where i self-published the book the book cost three and a half thousand pounds to produce with my own money um and since i'm in recent years i've actually had the book republished uh, i was quoted that's a 50 to sixty thousand pound job so to for a book to be sixty thousand pounds that i actually produce for three and a half thousand pounds shows what you can do with um you know with little money but you know big you know big drive and determination to make it happen and in terms of testing the concepts you know i wanted to test the concepts in jail the outside world I, you know i didn't care about that i didn't want a slice of that pie i didn't want a slice of any sort of um you know personal training in the outside world it was just this little unknown niche market in prison and i think that sort of gave it authenticity actually so from the book quickly become uh, one of the most requested books from prison libraries and uh, then i started to write for the prison inside time newspaper now i'll do some work for the for the way out tv fitness channel uh, in prison so things was a big gradual thing and for me the time element of launching the business in 2015 as a limited company just to sell a book i wanted to do it properly because anything criminal justice world you've got to tread carefully like me being an ex-offender my first time being fired back into jail you know i had that was that was about that was five years after leaving prison i was allowed to come back into prison for the first time so yeah if things have actually got to take their um, take their time uh, but keeping the organization it's i've always kept it small i've had no overheads it's been a one-man band for a lot of years so you know i'm in my office space right now my front room and you know, i've never had office spaces but when the book site the whole business started to become real was those little things like getting your email address with at cell workout it just sort of reaffirms that you know it's an actual thing um and I, I just think that was great and just you know when i first got my first business business account with rbs because the rbs supported the prince's trust i sort of went to link in with them more it just become more real and 
over the time developing the business, I've set since set up a social enterprise. I've set up a clothing company. I've set up you know all these different things. But I you know sometimes I've actually run quicker before I can walk. Uh, I learned the price of that in 2018. Uh, I tried to bring on three members of staff. I stretched myself to Fingley, and I had to sort of put the business on a bit of downtime. Um, I felt like I failed at first when the business went into hiatus in 2018, but it sort of gave me a bit of time to sort of like recharge my battery, go back to what I was good at. And basically, and since then I'm actually working with a team of 30 ex offenders um, and people that work in, in the prison service who are all committed to fitness training and all committed to rehabilitation. So, you know, although I failed if you hire, like financially hiring three people, I've now got a team of 30 people that we all support each other, not on a financial basis, but we are going to be getting to that point. Um, yeah, the, the building a network is so, so important. It's, you know, in terms of networking events, I've been to so many, try to throw my business cards anywhere. So try and cast your net uh, as widely as possible. And you don't know when these people will pop up down the line as well. So, you know, I've had discussions of, you know, uh, even to, just just for an example, just as was on our uh, call today, I've had someone uh, message me, hello LJ, don't know if you remember me, you came into Scrubs around five to six months ago and I was on day wing and you, and you spoke to a group of people and you gave me your business cards. Um, He's just reaching out for a, he's reaching out for a job, which is amazing to hear. It's those you know. I was networking in prison. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It hasn't got to be an official networking event. You can really create your own networking events. You haven't got to live in that box and say, "All right, I'm here to network." And sometimes, if you're networking, you know, don't do it falsely. Do it for the right reasons. Um, you know, you go there to learn, to speak to people, not just to get people's contacts because that might help you on some hierarchy thing. It's uh, you know, you've got to believe in people. I believe. Um, uh, in terms, yes, in, in terms of raising, in terms of raising money with the business, I've again, I've kept everything so small over the years. I've wanted to limit my risk as much as possible. So if I was to, uh, I've never took out massive loans. Um, again, I got a four thousand pound loan from the Prince's Trust, which was which I had to repay after I finished the book. But in terms, uh, was actually supported by the Forward Trust, and that was a rate five thousand pounds, and I actually matched fund five thousand pounds as well. So, it's raising funds. Be careful. Don't you know if if you are taking out loans? I've even took out a bounce back loan uh, the other day for seven thousand pounds, which isn't a huge amount of money. But why would I want to go and try and you know take out a loan of twenty thousand pounds, which I might not be able to repay? So, limit what you're. Um, In terms of scaling the business now, it was, uh, I think as Michael said before, you haven't got to rush the process. And what I knew I was onto a winner, I thought just keep slow and steady wins the race sometimes. And in terms, you can't, you can't scale a business by yourself. And that was my trouble. How do I find money to pay for people? And now the network of people, I have the 30 the ex-offender trainers, I think that's you know you can you make more money with working with more people. So delivering fitness sessions on a wider scale post lockdown is definitely where we're going to try and get to. Um, and the big aim for so the ten year anniversary will be next. No, it's, I think ten year anniversary is, is July twenty twenty two. So that's when I actually left jail. And I think for me that's when I'm going to basically say to myself that's when the cell workout gym will open. So I'd like it to be in London, but for me, now I've got a cell workout gym opening in July, 2022, I've now set myself a date. Like I set myself a date to create a book. Like I set myself a date to set up my social enterprise. It's now filling all the blanks from there. So with the forward trust, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure I'll hit that goal come 2022. Thank you. Well, that's the first time I've heard both yours and Michael's story and um, yeah, really, motivational, inspirational, and very insightful. Thank you very much indeed uh, to, to you all, actually. Um, it is 12 o'clock, so for those who do need to leave uh, in order to attend other commitments, please do feel free, to, feel free to do so. We do have a few questions coming through on the Zoom group chat, so I'll hand over to you, Stephen, to monitor and uh, enable people to yeah. ask the question. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Tev. Uh, thanks again, LJ and Michael. Uh, I know your stories both, and they are inspirational. I think one of the things of Forward Trust is to 
support your journey and to get your message out. A uh, couple of questions. One for both of you, L LJ and Michael, and if Benji and David want to come in on this, feel free. But have you coped during COVID? Is the first question. Give some short answers, guys. Uh, Michael. Yeah, hi guys. Um, yeah, interesting question actually. Um, I think most people that I know actually running businesses have really kind of been extremely worried like most of the world. Um, but I've tried to keep a positive spin on it and, and be productive as possible. Um, of course, we've had lots of clients put contracts on hold and things like that, but it's not stopped us as a company and organizations of, of actually getting into the prisons to teach what we've been doing for the last two years so we've just utilized the time the downtime at home uh you know turning strange places into offices and things like that um but yeah we've utilized the time come up with new ideas and obviously got the backlog of uh, clients finished off pretty much so it's actually quite nice for us um Andrew? yeah i think for me it was obviously covid's been a funny time for everybody but from last november i was planning my crowdfunder so there was really about, about around four months worth of planning for the crowdfunder to create these cell workout made in hmp t-shirts which the forward trust has supported and as I was filming these, uh, the, the crowdfunder videos actually in prison, um, whilst the COVID was happening, lockdown hadn't started. I finished filming the day lockdown come in. And then I had two weeks before, you know, before it actually really kicked in. Uh, and it was just strange that I was released in a crowdfunder to raise money and sort of promote what I was doing with this net, with this worldwide pandemic. And I, it felt a little bit out of sorts, but the good thing for me it let me focus on what I was doing I had to sort of not put on the news because I know if you put the news on so much that can that's not pretty good for your mental health so it actually helped me stay focused actually but after the month of running the uh, crowdfunder um, lockdown really hit me a month later and again trying to adapt now all my future work has been uh, it, it's I'm not the only one everyone's in the same boat we've all got to try and support each other and i'm planning for the future again the, the gym 2022 okay. it's coming thank you and a uh, quick quick answer from uh david and benji Re regarding covid and how have you coped and what lessons have you learned generally uh benji so, um yeah it, it, it's 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 a great question i suppose that from a sort of personal perspective, I'm very, very lucky to work for Deloitte. We have about 20,000 employees in the UK and about 300,000 globally. That said, there's just as, you know, just as we're hearing sort of Mike and LJ about their businesses, there's definitely things that we are doing and our senior leadership have been doing to try to protect the, you know, viability of our business and to make sure that people's jobs are, jobs are not affected and so they're having to make some really quite big decisions about it. I think that on a sort of like personal basis about my role, which is about helping Deloitte work with third parties and partner with them and do strategic alliances with them. I think that the way that we're trying to look at this is exactly as Michael said earlier, we're trying to be flexible, we're trying to be adaptable. And it's about recognizing that my responsibility is to help Deloitte people work with amazing companies and access their technology and their expertise to improve the services that we take to our clients. And I think that COVID has been a, a huge catalyst for change. You know, it's, it, there's been such, you know, horrifying parts of it. There are also positives in that it has changed the way that businesses operate and the sort of business, you know, sort of services that are provided. An example is a company called Miro, which is a sort of remote collaboration platform based out in the US. It was a company that Deloitte has been trying to use to manage how we work together remotely. And we've been struggling to sort of do it from a risk perspective. But actually when COVID hit and we had to move our 300,000 people to remote working pretty much overnight, all of a sudden you need to be able to use platforms like that. And I suppose I think that's why, well, I like to think, and I hope my role has become you know, more important because it's about us not just building stuff for ourselves, but also about how do we work with other companies to be able to use their products for our clients. And so I think it's, you know, on, on a personal basis, on a professional basis, it's about that flexibility and definitely 
not reading not reading the news too much because it is not good for your mental health it really is not right and david same question to you yeah, yeah it has been a difficult time um we were literally just at the point of getting our next round of investment for a startup i've been pretty much full time on so it was really my main income earner it was paying me pretty much for my full time income um, but basically the investor paused it as soon as COVID happened and we're going to regroup, I think next month maximum in August, which basically meant they didn't have the money to pay me anymore. But if I left, the thing would collapse and therefore everyone loses. So I said, look, you can't afford to pay me full time. Just pay me for a day a week. And I, but I'll still do the full time looking after the, the start in this period. So imagine your income cuts down to 20%, which isn't very much. But I knew I couldn't go out and get any more work because it's just impossible now. No one's contracting. So I thought, rather than sit there worrying, I've just been doing things like this. I've been on lots of webinars, speaking to young people. I'm raising, I've started up a fundraiser to raise some money to buy devices for kids from disadvantaged backgrounds because they're all at home trying to do remote learning, but they haven't got a computer. So I'm about to launch a fundraiser to do that. So, yeah, I've lost income, but I'm just giving my time that I've got to help other people. And then we'll hopefully in July, August, get the funding moving on this startup and get going again. Mm. But yeah, in the, in, the, in the meantime, I think just help as many other people as we can, mm. knowing that we need help as well. But I think that's the key is, is I think it was like LJ said, it's, it's even about networking. It's not what can I get, it's what can I give? And I think that's what we can do in COVID is give as much as survive and get as well. Great, great message. Another question has been raised here uh, for LJ and Michael. How do you receive guidance and advice on management challenges, such as managing staff, HR, premise management, etc.? So, uh, yeah, what advice would you give in terms of receiving guidance and advice on management challenges? LJ? Yeah, well, for me, it was uh, when I was in prison. Um, I remember seeing this this red poster up in the um, up in the library, and it's, I, rem I remembered what the uh, logo was, and it was you know, roughly the Prince's Trust. I knew what it was about, helping young people, and though they, they were my go-to people to basically help me start this, and um, uh, invaluable uh, thing was that it was actually a sign of business mentor. And uh, we were like, he was assigned me in 2016. We're not even on the Prince's Trust program now, but he's literally a funk away if anything goes wrong. And he's not fun, he's not involved with the business, he's just there for like basically the greater good of it. So, any sort of career is like that. I think to have that go to person who absolutely has got your best interests at heart, um, and Andy Packer's mine, and I'm sure you'll find, you'll find your own version, but you've got to try and find that person. Um, but in terms of management, HR, you know, I've, you know, I've always worked by myself and worked with people. But when I actually did bring in the two to three people on a PAYE and a sub and contract basis, um, I didn't balance. I did. I wasn't able to balance the books. I was paying them before paying myself. It was. I learned a lot of lessons. It was a real, real struggle. But. I'm now the wiser going forward when I bring people on PAYE and various contracts. Um, yeah, it's, you know, who, who are you talking about this to daily? That's, you know, that's, that's the key thing. Same, same with you regarding the guidance. Yeah, management. Um, fantastic question again. Um, for me personally, obviously I've been in business in many different avenues around the world and I've met lots of very influential and genuine people along the way and I think I mentioned earlier it's, it's always good to keep the connections very close um, because you never know when you're going to need something and, and you never know when you can help them as well um, so I kind of lean on my own network as much as I can without being annoying um, I think the difference now is that uh, I've never really been based in London um, so it's a little bit different to how I'm used to doing business it's a little bit more formal so I've had to learn actually um, the formalities of doing business in London, um, which has been a, a quite a learning curve for me. And um, yeah, I've just learned a lot of people and, and also the full trust helped me out um, at the beginning of Pink Umbrella Studios uh, in terms of accountancy work and things like that. Um, so that was a great help. Uh, for the second question, now HR, we, we predominantly work um, within the justice system and we predominantly contract to ex-offenders and actually people inside the prison system so 
it comes with its complications, as you can imagine. Um, there's there's lots of red tape, and we can only do certain things, and and also our time timelines and time frames are much much more extended to the normal business uh, when we're utilizing uh, our contractors um, but again uh, I, I've, I've employed many people under the pay system in different countries so I have got quite a lot of experience with that um, never have I employed or contracted ex-offenders before um, and that's what we set out to do in Pink Umbrella Studios so again we, we, we lean on companies and organizations that are already in the space um, there's various different companies such as Code 4000, Catch 22, um, Launch 22. There's lots of organizations in and around the UK that are more than happy to help as long as they know you're genuine and what you're trying to achieve. Great. Thank, thank you, guys. Uh, another question, LJ and Michael. What would be the most useful resource for people in prisons that are looking to start up business? Uh, LJ? Um, I'd, it was the, it was the Prince's Trust Enterprise course that um, that I had done, and I'm pretty sure that they. I'm not, I know they work in some prisons, but it's only under thirty. Um, I think probably the Prisoner Education Trust. Then they, you know, they're a, they they basically deliver um, distance learning. So if you can get if you have anyone in if, if there's anyone in prison that you know right now, uh, have a look at what courses are available from the Prisoner Education Trust and. It's a slight application process, but if they meet the criteria and they want to study study business, then um, then yeah, I'd, I'd say look into the Prisoner Education Trust. And uh, Michael, uh, for me, I can't really not talk about Code Four Thousand because it's kind of where Pink Umbrella Studios was birthed. Um, the, the, this organisation teach people how to code inside prison, uh, actually in workshops. Um, and I, I came across this um, way up north in Yorkshire in HMP Humber, uh, just by absolute chance, and absolutely loved the organisation, loved what they were doing to, to gain real outcomes of people coming through the gate and, and going into actually coding programming. Um, so for me, that that was you know I, I've spent quite a long time in prison and. I've always found it a little bit restrictive in terms of information and data and, and what you can actually learn and use in the real world. Um, so uh, that's why we kind of set Pink Umbrella Studios up to, to kind of give back because um, for me personally, I thought that there wasn't much opportunity available inside the UK prison system. Um, so when I came out, that, that's what we did. We set up to try and give them opportunities back. Uh, but yeah, Code 4000. Um, and obviously Open University is a great resource and if you've got the time, which is possibly unfortunate, but I would highly recommend uh, getting, getting in touch with the Open University, use your time wisely. Great, thank you. Okay guys, thank you very much for that. And just before I hand back to Tev, uh, thanks for all the guys that are still with us, quite a few of you are still with us. I would all encourage people to really have a look at uh, Forward Enterprise Fund's website feel free to talk with me and Tev about future projects you may have regarding our client group. And uh, yeah, let's keep the lines of communication open and see how we can help you or help each other with your projects. Uh, Tev. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so yeah, obviously at the end of our event, uh, our first virtual event, um, it's gone a lot smoother than I anticipated, having nightmares all night last night, thinking what happens if my internet connection um, ceases. <coughs> just like to thank everybody uh, for joining, particularly our, our uh, esteemed panel. A um, few little notes uh, to provide to, towards the end now. Firstly and foremostly, uh, you should all expect to receive a short survey from uh, either myself or Stephen in the next few days, just to capture some feedback so that we can use that uh, to improve any future such events. Uh, and secondly, we do intend to post this video on the Forward Trust YouTube channel. Not quite sure how that's going to happen, but I'm sure, I've been assured that there are systems in place to allow us to do this. So please, um, I will send the link out to all the uh, participants um, once that's all been prepared. So please do free, feel free to forward that on turn of your service users or to use as, an, uh, as, a, as, a, as a tool in uh, so far as helping you deliver the service that you, that you provide. Um, I think that's about it, folks. Once again, thanks very much for everyone for joining. Thanks to our uh, members of the panel. And um, keep a lookout for the masterclass uh, virtual events coming up sometime in August and September. Thanks, guys. See ya. Bye bye. Thanks, Dad. Bye bye.